Okay, good morning. We're starting right on time. Uh, so the first presentation for the next 50 minutes is uh, with Daniel from the front of uh, Institute on a, a project around DGA generation by malware. Yep. You have the floor. Hello, BotConf. Good morning. Uh, nice that so many made it. So not that many casualties from last night. Um, who was here at last year's BotConf? That's quite a lot. Who has seen my lightning talk on the same project? OK, so some of you might know how this talk will start. Um, is this a generated domain or not? Yeah. Yes, it is. You were so convinced. What, what family is it? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, it's CryptoLocker. Yeah. OK, what, what about the second one? Is this generated? Nope. No? Yeah, but yes, it is. So it's, this one is URL zone. Um, there's a third one, but that was my cat. So the general issue with that is, by just looking at the domains, you have not really a good idea what kind of DGA that is. And that was a really frustrating situation to me. So I started looking at DGAs, then I got hooked on DGAs and tried to find as many as possible of them, find as many Cs as possible. And it's basically where we ended up with this project DG archive that I'm going to talk about here. So agenda. Um, first, I'm going to do a quick introduction on DGAs. So basically, what is it? Where does it come from? How is it used? What purpose does it fit? Then um, my project DG archive and what you can do with it. Then I'm going to compare basically features you can find out about DGAs and all of the ones that are connected there. Um, I'm very lucky that I was able to get the registration info for about 80 million domains by domain tools. They collaborated with me on that one. And then I'm, we are looking closer a bit on, on some of the details that you can do with that kind of data. Um, whole talk is TLP green, but there will be one short section afterwards that's TLP amber, so some content only for this conference. But there's only two slides and you will basically see in advance. Please don't tweet about that. Everything otherwise is fine. OK. So domain generation algorithms. Um, it's a concept that was basically first described back in 2008 at least from what I can tell. So back then, it was called domain flux. Um, some of you might know, on the other hand, fast flux, fast flux service networks. So the idea behind that is that you have one domain name or a few domain names that resolve to a lot of IP addresses. So that was basically in order to, to harden your CNC infrastructure over IP addresses. Domain flux is the inverse principle. You will have a lot of domain names that point to potentially little number of IP addresses. So. In order to achieve this, you can use a domain generation algorithm. So basically, an algorithm that is able to produce CNC information, rendezvous points, dynamically. And you can think of that as a shared secret between your malware, or the guy who coded it, on the compromised host, and your botmaster. Because he obviously has to know how to generate those domains in order to uh, register them. Um, then I will be talking about seeds. Seeds are generally just a collection of parameters um, that are used to influence the algorithm to produce a certain set of domains. And occasionally, I might be using this term algorithmically generated domain, or more likely the abbreviation AGD, because it's quick to talk about that. And that's basically just domains that fall out of a DGA. OK, what was the first DGA? So um, looking at a lot of stuff, I basically found one variant of Sality, which did something that you could call domain generation back in 2006. So in February 2006, there's this one variant of Celity that uses hard-coded second-level and top-level domains, but generates a third-level domain for that. So this is already an algorithm that modifies domains. But since the main component of the render view is not used for the CNC contact, because if you already have a hard-coded second-level domain part, you can use it directly, I wouldn't call this the first instance of a DGA. So it basically does it, but it doesn't use it to find the CNC server. I actually have no idea why they put it in there, maybe for authentication, because if you only generate that pair of third-level domains on that day, you, you want to authenticate your malware checking in. Never found out. It's so far in the past, it's hard to get information on that. So the next two instances, both around July 2007, are on the one hand topic. So there's one analysis report by VeriSign that already documents DGA-like domains that are later also or can be generated by the work that Brad Stone Gross did when he took over topic in 
uh, early 2008. And on the other hand, you can find Kraken. So, um, John Berminek, are you here? Not seeing him. Um, at least he blocked um, in April 2008 on ISC block um, about Kraken, and he listed one hash that was uploaded in July 2007 to VirusTotal. So that was also, on the other hand, the, one of the first instances that I was able to find the DJA binary, if you want so. Um, it was then first publicly mentioned in April of 2008, which is also around the time that I found um, where DGA as a concept was first publicly mentioned. Um, but the concept itself really took off only in November 2008 to April of 2009. So um, first, there was Sribi, there was this takedown of Macolo, this malicious infrastructure, and the bot masters of Sribi were able to regain control because they had a backup DGA in their binaries which then started suddenly generating domains. And I think um, back at the time, it was probably overseen that there was this type of functionality in the binary. Yeah, second one, Configure. Probably don't need to talk that much about this one because it was very well documented. And third one, obviously, Topic, which, like I mentioned, um, was taken over and then published about um, by Brad Stonegrass. So what they did, since Topic only generates three domains per day and three per week. Um, a group of researchers went there and just registered those domains before the bot masters did and synchroed all the traffic. And that basically gave, among the, the first insight on um, what's the ratio of dynamic, uh, dynamic IPs with regard to, to static IPs. They locked all of the credentials that were submitted and this somewhat kicked off all of this ethical debate on um, what can you do with malware research. Okay, so why would you want to use DGAs? So this probably a couple of reasons for that. Um, it really aggravates analysis. So back in the good old days, it was just as easy as running a sample, dumping it, and you could just see in memory all the domains it probably will talk to. Um, not so possible with DGAs, because you have to do code analysis in order to infer how that algorithm works. It does evasion. So if you have a DGA that is time-based, so you will see different domains being generated at different points in time, um, you will have many DGAs that have rather short-lived domains, so maybe just one day and so on. And the reaction time of blacklists has to be really short in order to grab on, on on those domains as well in order to be able to blacklist them quick enough. And then again, you have basically a lot of entries in your blacklist that are outdated just after one day. So it basically pollutes your blacklists in a certain way. You have backup. So it's probably smart to, to have a DGA in your binary because you only need to register those domains whenever you need back access. And that basically brings us to the next point. You have asymmetry. So the attacker only needs to control a single domain in order to have control over its botnet, um, while the defender needs to prohibit access to all of the domains. So it's kind of horrible from a defender perspective. And yeah, in the end, it's pretty feasible to use DJS because domains are pretty cheap by now. So even if you run a DJA that has like a validity of, of one day, you just shell out five bucks for a domain, and then you have control of your, your botnet for one day. Okay, so DJAs are pretty annoying, I'd say. So I had this idea, uh, why not go there, and yeah, since I reverse a lot, reverse all of the DJAs I can find, or basically get them contributed by other people, and then generate all of the domains and put them in a database. Because this gives some nice use cases, so um, we have this database, DG Archive, and what you can now do with it is, for example, you can query a domain name. So you can ask DG Archive, is this a DGA domain? And it will tell you, yeah, for example, it's my name. Uh, not only that, since I was able to yeah, basically know how to generate them and when they are valid, it also tells you, yeah, this domain was valid on this and that day. And that's something that's probably helpful if you're doing forensics or going through browser logs, proxy logs, and so on. See occasions there and maybe are able to look into a window of domains. And since we have a database of domains, it's also pretty much possible to just give up block lists based on that. Okay, so at that la lightning talk last year, um, I had coverage of about eight families with 20 seats and 4 million domains. Um, said this before I went for botconf, is now 43 different families and variants. I basically had to split up some of the families and variants because they are technically the same code base, but the DGA is so different that you can call it a different variant in that case. And there's coverage of about 280 seats with um, just shy of 
20 million domains. So it's quite a lot by now. Okay, so how do I proceed in finding DGAs? Um, it's more or less, since my, my background is somewhat academic, also being a PhD student, um, I look at papers. So that's basically the first. And you can find a range of papers that basically propose systems in order to find DGAs. Um, so I remixed the, the knowledge that you can find there with some common sense of my side. And from Shadow Server, thanks to you guys, um, I see basically the whole DNS feed of their sandboxes. So all of the callouts that you get for single samples are provided through this kind of feed. And from those 1.2 million sandbox runs with about 50 million domain lookups, 1 million unique domains, I basically run analysis on a per sample basis there and try to find as many DGA candidates as possible. Procedure for that is I first filter out with lists like Alexa. I have a self-created blacklist because you will find many samples that look like they call to DGA domains, but actually they are just hard-coded or someone typed on the keyboard like my cat um, in order to have domains in there. And I can also filter out through DG Archive because if, I, if there's a domain that I already have in my database, I can pretty much say, yeah, probably that family and I don't have to look at it. Um, second step, I then need to do scoring for domains and the principles I apply there are first engram analysis. You have some combinations of characters, letters that are more common in language or domains than others. Um, less frequent of such combinations give a higher value. That's basically the whole idea. Then you have to tune it a lot and eventually it will work. Um, I also do entropy analysis, meaning if you have a wide or uniform distribution of characters, this also yields a higher score. Um, then you can see that many of the DGAs use quite long domain names or because Think of it from a marketing perspective. You run a business, you want a short domain because nobody can recognize a long domain and wants to type that stuff. So um, it's more likely, or at least I found that many of the DJs for some reason use longer domains because they are less registered. But we'll see about that later. Um, and then in, you also have annex domain because the idea is if you generate a lot of domains anyway, many of them will not be registered. So many of them will return that they are not resolving to any IP address. So that's basically the four things that I use for scoring there. And what I also do, since I reversed, or basically got all those re-implementations of those DGAs, um, I have a pretty good feeling about how the domains look like that those DGAs generate. So I have a feeling for what's the minimum and maximum length that the domain has, what's the alphabet, for example, are there some characters missing, does it also include numbers, does it have a dash in there, because there are some, or at least two that I know of that also use a dash. And what are the TLDs that are generally associated with that and this and that family? And this matching step is pretty interesting because if I have a match for many of the domains, but it's not in DG Archive, I likely have a new seed. So I have to look at that sample and extract that seed, push it into DG Archive. If I have no match or inconsistent matches, it's likely that I may have found a new DGA. So I analyze this as well. That's a lot of handwork but I think it gives quite good results to follow that approach. Okay, so second part, um, DGA features. So what are typical features of DGAs? Um, example characteristics can be something like what I would call a DGA class and a generation scheme, more of that in a second. Um, and what you can also see is that a lot of DGAs use well-known algorithms like um, pseudo-random number generators of certain type that are known, or hashing like MD5, SHA-256 and so on. And you can find that in the algorithms as well. Um, of course, domain structure, like I just mentioned, so you will have a minimum maximum length, average length, an alphabet that's used by DGA. You will have this set of TLDs you, you can see there. Then you, in case you have a time-dependent DGA, you can also see what's the validity period of single domains and also how many domains are generated per cycle. Because if you take something like Configure with its 50,000 domains per day, that's quite, quite characteristic for this one. Um, this is only covered indirectly through the number of generated domains later on. Um, you can also look at domain randomness. It's also basically, I, I cut it out for this talk. If you want to have more information on that, just see me offline in the break, and um, we can talk about that. And CNC priority. Um, I had the impression that many people think that DGAs are mostly used as backup algorithms in, in malware and so on. Um, that was also my impression before I started with that research. 
Um, and the thing is, actually, yes, DGAs are more or less always used as last priority in malware. But you also have 28 families out of the 40 that basically use DGA as their only CNC mechanism. So although it's the, the only one or last one, it's basically the, the relevant one for those malware families. Um, 28 because there's five that actually use hard-coded domains, but they have more or less no relevance because the malware author or the bot master knows yeah, the DGA works anyway, so I don't have to care about my hard-coded domains any longer. Okay, so those DGA classes have been defined by my colleague Thomas Barabosch, who is giving a talk tomorrow. Um, in, back in 2012, and he says, or basically the group of researchers there found out or postulated there are two basic characteristics you can find out for a DGA. So the first one is, is it time dependent? So will it generate different domains over time? And is it deterministic? Deterministic in that sense meaning, um, does, or is basically at every time all information available that you need to generate domains? And they basically had to introduce a class because you might have heard about Topic, which had a later variant that used Twitter trends in order to generate domains. So you cannot pre-generate them beyond a certain date. And on the other hand, there's BDAP, which uses um, currency values, which are also published daily, more or less, and you can no longer um, pre-generate them beyond one week. So that's basically a limiting factor in how you can pre-generate domains there. And for the last one, time independent and non-deterministic, um, this would be something like a shotgun approach, probably. I have a feeling that VRoot is doing that because they are seeding with um, the x86 instruction read timestamp counter, which totally mix up the, the seeding. And they have only six letter domains with .com. So basically, they, they just do random domains and hope that they probably hit one of their domains, I think. Otherwise, the DJS broken and not used. I'm not totally sure about that. Otherwise, please discuss with me about that. I want to find that out. And the second thing is generation schemes. So I've seen more or less four different kinds how DGAs work. So there are arithmetic DGAs that are the ones that you normally assume that are, are those that are generate those, those basically random sequences of characters, numbers, and so on. Um, secondly, you have wordless DGAs. So basically, they pick words from a word list and put them in a sequence. Then you have hash-based DGAs. There are only two right now. Um, which basically have a full hash as their domain name. And finally, there is one family, or volatile CDAS, I think uh, rather the, the actor name, um, but the malware is called Explosion, at least by Kaspersky and so on, um, that uses permutation. That means you start out with one domain and just switch the order of the letters in there. So it didn't fit with, with the other scheme, so I thought having its own class would make sense. Okay. Now we play Jeopardy. Um, I thought, how do you represent that much information? Because I had it um, when I started writing the paper, everything at the table. And plotting a table with 40 entries on a slide doesn't make any sense because you would have to be like that close to be able to read anything. So I thought to go with this matrix kind of style. And first, we are going to look at what's the distribution of uh, classes and schemes here. So the majority of those DGAs is actually time-based. So 22, 55% of the ones that I know of are time dependent and also deterministic. That means you can, once you have the algorithm and have seeds, you can pre-generate the <laughs> domains that those DJS use. Um, another 16 are time independent. That means given a seed in the algorithm, you can generate a static list of domains. And there are those two examples that are non-deterministic um, that need, like I said, Twitter feed. I don't have that one, and I think the Twitter API changed anyway, so this one is no longer relevant. Um, but there's also BDAP using this, this currency inf information, and this one is very relevant since it's an active family. Okay, so next, what generation schemes do they use? And the vast majority uses arithmetic schemes. So it's a good 85% of, of those DJAs basically produce those more or less completely random domain names. Um, another three use word lists. So Superbox, I think another name for that one would be Nifdort. For Gozi, it would be Yoursniff. You see the usual problem arise again. Um, I try to stick with the Microsoft names because from my feeling, their detection engine produces quite stable uh, detections once they have a detection for something. 
And yeah, like I said, there's two families that use hashing. So Barmetal produces those MD5 long ones. And Dyer uses an excerpt of, the, of a SHA-256 hash and prepends it also with a letter. And yeah, there's this one P version, so this permutation volatile cedar. And in brackets, you can see that I basically also wrote the algorithms. Um, like I said, 11 of those use LCG, whatever that is. I'm going to explain it in a second. Um, the more exotic ones, the, the one I really like is, for example, NIMEM, which, which uses the probably less known PR energy uh, score, score shift. And the Quarkbot guys actually run a custom implementation of Mesen Twister. So it's not the standard one. I was happy. I basically recognized it as Mesen Twister. Thought, OK, can we use it? Nope. Um, had to rewrite this whole stupid PR energy myself because I do Python. And there was not a custom one of Python, but I found the original implementation that they ripped and put into their malware, which is some Japanese C implementation of Mesen Twister. Um, yeah, for a couple other ones, you can see MD5 and so on. So what's LCG? Um, LCG is the linear congruential generator. It's a really, really simple scheme on how to generate more or less random numbers. Um, it works this way. You have a seed you start off with. It's xn in this example. You multiply it with a value a. You add a value c. You do modulo m and end up with a new random number that you can then again put in again. And by doing this, you end up with a sequence of random numbers. Um, there are many different variants of that. For example, there's the Park and Miller one. These are the guys who proposed this algorithm in the 80s. You will have this, this famous book, Numerical Recipes, and there's an implementation of it in there. Microsoft Visual Studio and many of the other DJAs also run custom values for A and, a and C, at least. Um, that doesn't give them perfect randomness anymore. Yeah, but LCG also is pretty limited in that domain, um, but allows them to customize. So what would a really trivial DJA look like based on this LCG? So let's take this, this Python code here. Um, in order to generate a domain, we need some TLDs. In this case, we have those five TLDs, comnet, org, ru, and tv. Um, then we want to have domains that are 10 characters long, so we need a for loop. And what we are doing now is um, we are running our random number generator, doing this LCG, and cropping the output to the range of 0 to 25 by doing modulo 26. OK. Now we add this to hex 61, which is the ASCII representation, or the equivalent to A, and end up with a range of A to Z. Because there are 26 letters in the alphabet, so 0 plus 25 is basically A to Z. Do this 10 times. We also roll our dice again for the domains and end up with something like that. So it's really a really, really simple of, uh, example of a DGA. OK, um, domain structure. So there's way too much information in that slide. I still put it in there so you can read it offline later on, because those levels will obviously be, be um, published. Uh, what you can see is the minimum length, maximum length for the domains those GGS generate, the TLDs that are used, or the number of different TLDs, more or less, and the size of the alphabet that those DGS use. So before you get lost in numbers, um, let's focus on that one. Um, Configer and Nikers are the ones that use by far the most different TLDs. So for config, it's the infamous version C, which uses alone, I think, 119 or something different TLDs spread all over the, the different registers. Um, Nikos also uses 43 of them. Um, what this helps you is you will probably in normal life never see the TLDs that those DGAs use. So that's basically a dead, give a, uh, dead giveaway that you have one of those two DGAs if you see them in domain logs. Then we have a couple of those that use at least five different DGAs, at least per seed. Um, that's still pretty annoying, because um, if you want to mitigate a threat like that, you basically have to talk to a lot of registrars in order to get all those domains blocked if you want to do it on that level, or have to buy a lot of domains from, from different TLDs. Um, good news, most of them basically use less than five. Um, even if there's timber with 15 here, that means just that I've seen 15 different TLDs for timber, but there's at most four in one sample. Okay. Um, size of alphabet. Um, we have this volatile cedar thingy. It has the smallest one. It's only nine different letters. Yeah, of, course, of course, if you have permutation, that means you will not get any new ones in there. So basically, this whole .NET Explorer thing that you have in start has nine different characters, and you will not have more or less than that. Um, Barmetal is a hash. 
So we'll have the range from A to Z, or A to F, and 0 to 9. So that's 16. Um, the very most DGAs use 26, so the whole range from A to Z. There are two of them that have A to Z plus a dash. So Matsnu and Redams have 27. Uh, naturally, the next one, there's four of them using 36, so characters and numbers. And then you have those. So I've cut out what's wrong with these ones. If you have time in the end, um, I'm going to cover those as well. OK, um, domain length, there's way too much to talk about that one and compare it, so I leave it out as well. Um, like I said, just see me afterwards if you're interested in that one. Um, registration status, that's basically that what I was interested in the most after having a lot of DGA domains. So um, after collecting them, having a lot of seeds, um, I thought, what can, what can you do with that? So um, questions that arise there are, how many potential DGA domains are there? So my approach was, okay, if I have a family that was first spotted at some date, I just generate all of the domains until a certain date. So right now for me, this is end of this year. Um, then there's a question like, are there collisions between DGAs? So are there DGAs that basically generates an overlapping set of domains. And finally, how many of the DGA domains are registered? Because if you look around, there's no ground proof on that at all. And I hope I can give some estimates or answers to that. So we conducted a study um, with a data set of DG Archive that we fixed to the uh, 26th, 22nd of uh, September this year. And like I said, we use the AGDs basically generated from whenever we saw family first until end of this year. Um, eternal thanks to Michael Klett and Domain Tools because they provided me with the whole historic who is data for all of those domains. So I could do many, many interesting, funny things on that. And evaluating the information you can grab from who is data gives you things like what of those domains are sinkholes, because many of the sinkhole operators, most of them, I think, um, put that information either in the registrant field, in the email field, or in the name servers. So it's based, based on who is data, it's possible to spot quite a lot of sinkholes. Um, since it's historic who is data, you can also see when registration entries changed. So if you have first a registration that points to some name server, and later points to a sinkhole server, that gives you a hint about, okay, someone took control over that domain especially if that happens before the domain normally would expire. Um, then you can look at pre-registrations. So think of it that way. We have a DGA, generates some domains, and someone registered domains of that DGA far before this DGA first appeared. Okay, so this means you have collisions with probably benign services. And that's pretty annoying because if you want to run a blacklist with pre-generated domains, and you basically have those in there, it means you might end up blocking legitimate domains as well. And finally, domain parking. Um, I found one case where basically um, a domain parker used one and a half thousand domains to drive traffic through advertisement. That's at least my assumption how it looks like. Um, so that might also be a use case for DGAs. So he registered domains from, I think, five or so different DGAs to, to have the bots go to um, domain C controls. Okay, here's another random fact. Um, we first saw DGAs come up in 2007, but in fact, more than half of the DGAs appeared 2013 and later. So it's something that really picked up speed in the last two years. Okay, so a lot of DGAs again. Um, who is generating the most domains? Yeah, in famous config again. If you do 50,000 domains, per year, uh, per, per day, do this for more than six years, then you end up with a very, very large number, like 125 million domains. Um, I'm using free seeds. Two of them are A and B variants of config, and they are more or less negligible because they do 250 and 500 domains, so just a fraction of what this, the C version does. Um, the next big ones are those four. They have at least a couple million domains. I think Game Over DJA tried to step in the foots of Configur by doing 10,000 domains per day, at least one of the two seats you can find there. Um, Murofed does 1,000 per day and is active for a long time. CryptoLogger does also 1,000 per day. Nikos does 2,048 per four days and has a couple of seats. Um, then at least we have a couple of DJAs that, looking at their period, generated more than 50,000 domains. And all of those families you can see here 
are basically time-based DGAs. So they are basically really the ones that are responsible for generating a lot of domains. Um, there's only two time-independent DGAs that also have, or that I track with more than 50,000 domains. On the one that, that's Tiny Banker because they are really active. They push out new campaigns every other week, I think. And Bungary, which does up to 15,000 domains per seed. So that's why you end up with a lot of domains there as well. Um, many of the, the very others have less than 50,000 even with multiple seeds. You have something like Remnet, which has 18 different seeds, but also only 18,000 unique domains. Um, altogether, during that study, I ended up with something in the domain of 143 million potential domains and at least 18.5 million without configure. It's still a lot. OK, so um, there are two ways how DGAs can collide. So first, you can have collisions within your DGA, meaning the same DGA with the same seed will generate the same domains over time. That's certainly possible, because if you have limited randomness and so on, domains will repeat over time. That's especially the case if you look at Superbox, so this, this one thing that I mentioned, uh, which, which is a word, word list DGA, you have 384 words in your word list, and you combine always only two words of that. It gives you a very limited number of combinations you can do. And if you look at a long period of time, those will repeat over time. And then you have the second case, are there DGAs that collide against each other? So let's look at this one first. Um, so my gut feeling told me I should first look at collisions of configure with other ones. Um, I'll let you guess. So what, what's your guess? How many collisions do we have between configure and the other DGAs? Just shout. Anyone? What? Thousands. Thousands, OK. Yeah? No, 15. It's only 15 collisions between configure and the other one. So it's really far less than I also thought what there would be. Um, Nikas actually, in that case, benefits by using um, 43 different TLDs, because that gives you more overlap with configure. And with the other ones, it's the case, these are normally really small domains, so five to six letters. Because otherwise, it's like. <laughs> Very, very unlikely that you generate nine letters with two different algorithms, and they, they still overlap. OK, so we put configure out. Um, with having seen that there are only 15 between configure and the other ones, do you think there are still collisions between those remaining DGAs? Yes, no? Yes? Yeah, there's one single collision. And that's between Pixbar and Nightman. And the domain looks like this. And that's exactly what I thought. <laughs> so that's really coincidence. So not basically made up by me. And yeah, <laughs> that's how I felt. <laughs> but that's really good to know. Because if you don't have collisions between DGAs, that does mean you can perfectly use it to identify malware families. Because you don't have the issue that you might take a family with something that overlaps. So if they perfectly exclude each other, it's a really good tool to um, tag malware families and even down to, to campaigns or seeds. That's basically the, the takeaway of the, this study. OK. Yeah, then I said um, it's possible that domains collide with benign services, because that's what might happen if you have, for example, a wordless DJA. So at least that's what I would anticipate. Um, let's first have a look how many domains are registered at all, because we need that in order to um, see how many are benignly registered. OK, so those, again, are the unique domains for those families. And the very most, oh, no, first, um, I don't have data for those four families. So for configure, it's simply too many domains. And um, it's hard to get that kind of information because the registration for those domains is blocked as well. So I think um, Domain Tools told me that you would have to guess. So since I wanted to have a really consistent database, I just said, OK, then we don't look at configure. And for the other ones, it's DDNS. So you usually have only one um, second level domain. And I also wanted to exclude them for the same reason. Because you could basically do something like passive DNS to, to get that kind of information. Um, but still, then you would have to guess. And you don't have the um, wealth of information that Whois provides you. OK, so with the other ones, um, the one with the very most registrations is Game Over P2P. OK, why should that be the case? Um, 
yeah, you might remember that there was a takedown. And in cause of this takedown, many, many domains have been registered. Um, this does, for example, not include all of the Russian domains, because instead of registering, they were blocked. And that's also something that's not providing any who is info in that case. You can ask the, the register, oh, we have a protocol, and they tell you, nope, you cannot register them. So that's not reflected in here. So it, the number should actually be a bit higher um, in the sense of domains that are not available. Um, then we have those. They have high relative numbers of registrations. So I'm going by percentage now. All of them have more than 10% registrations. And for all of the, on the left side, ex excluding Superbox, you can see they have less than 4,000 domains. So that somewhat explains the um, high relative number. And Superbox with those 11,000 domains and no takedown, as far as I know, um, looks interesting as well. Um, then you have those, more than 5%. And you see there's not actually that many. So this, this one down there has 13. As per bot, I found only 15. But I only know a limited net of, uh, set of seats there. Uh, Remnant, which also had a takedown, only has 900, which I cannot explain for some reason. And this one is also probably a rather unpopular family and has few registrations. So then you have some that have less relative but high absolute registration. So all of the green ones now have more than 1,000 registrations. And two other names show up here. That's Barmital and CryptoDocker. And both of them also had takedowns. So that explains a bit their higher numbers. And all of the other ones have both low relative and absolute numbers of registrations. OK. So it gives us a total of round about 115,000 registrations that I know of, which is 0.62% of those 80.5 million domains that are potentially generated. So less than 1% is, is likely registered. Yeah. Like I said, um, those three were takedowns. And how many of those are takedowns? Actually, the, the vast majority. So um, looking at that, you have 72,000 registrations that are related to the game over P2P takedown. Almost 8,000 of the Barmitov ones, almost 3,000 of the CryptoLocker ones, which then again means that 72.56% of those 115,000 domains are actually ones that have been um, basically done together with the takedown. Um, yeah, this, this next interesting thing, do DJAs collide with pre-registered, that's what I call it, ben likely benign domains. Um, we exclude those again. Um, your gut feeling might tell you if you have a DJA that uses word lists. That makes it probably more likely that domains are registered by other people because those domain names are attractive, or at least more attractive than 20 character long random names. And indeed, um, you can see that those three families have rather high registrations even before their families appeared. Um, in case of Superbox, this is really drastic. So um, they about three fourths of all the domains you have there that have been registered before early 2013, I think, when this family first showed. You can see that many of them even were registered in the early 2000s. Because two names, .net, sounds like something you, you might want to have to start a business. Because especially the, the choice of words implies it. So um, those guys really, I think, wanted to melt into the, the benign domains. Uh, for Gozi, Matsno, it's, it's Far less, but it's still a high relative number there. Um, you have a couple more families that also have a lot of pre-registered domains. And that's mostly because they have short domain names. I'm doing a breakdown shortly on that. Um, those families have at least some pre-registrations before they first appeared. And all of the others have no single registration. That's because we have seen earlier that many, or basically the majority of them, uses arithmetic concepts, so generating really random domain names which makes it really unlikely that someone wanted to get those domains before um, the family appeared. OK, so what can we conclude from that? Um, let's break down, again, those pre-registrations. A good 90% of them are wordless DGAs, which leaves us with a good 1,000 domains. Out of them, another 93% have only a length of 5 to 6. So the longer a domain gets, of a DGA, it's very unlikely that it's um, somehow registered by someone that's not related to the, the malware, actually, or a sinkola. Um, you will have accidental real words 
So this is, for example, a domain generated by Pushto. And I think it makes sense that someone might have registered that one. And the other ones that are longer than six and collide are what I call rather pronounceable names. So it's easy to speak something like Kankanana or Kandelmeet. And that's something that you will find for basically all of those domains. I think many of them might even have a meaning in, the, in a lot of language. I think yesterday we also heard that um, there are, to the Western world, random looking domains that are generated by, by Asian countries, mainly. And that's also what I saw. So many of them basically are registered with a Chinese registrar. Um, but the good news is, since we don't have that many collisions with non wordless DGAs and long domains, it's fair to use them for blocking because we'll almost have no false positives with that. So I think it's pretty viable to use those pre-generated domains in order to do blocking. OK, so more or less the last part, before I might have time for the bonus part, we'll see about that. Um, consider time-dependent DGAs. For time-dependent DGAs, you can think of something, when do those domains get registered relatively to the time when those domains get valid? So I have a DGA that generates domains today, and I want to use those domains. So it might be a good idea to register them like three days in advance. So I definitely have those domains when they become valid. Um, since those domains have a window of validity, we can do a calculation of this registration look ahead. That's basically what I called it here. So the offset, the relative offset between when a domain becomes valid and when it was registered. And I try to um, differ between sinkholes and non-sinkholes because you can see some differences here. Um, another flood of information incoming because that was, to my feeling, the, the best way to represent that stuff. Um, what you can see here, basically the middle axis means um, if a domain becomes valid and it's registered on the same day, the data point will sit here in the middle. If it's registered before the domain becomes valid, it will be shifted to the left. If it's registered afterwards, it will be shifted to the right. And the red bars that you can see is basically the validity that those DGAs have. So for game over peer to peer, it's possible that domains are valid up to seven, uh, seven days. Uh, for Gozi, you might have domains that are valid for a full three months and so on. And you basically see how that this more or less um, shows in the data. So first observation is um, sinkholes are normally registered much earlier than non-sinkholes. Let them be malicious ones or some that I were not able to identify as sinkholes. I think that's pretty much uh, what you would also assume. Because as a sinkholer, you can always benefit from the data that's coming in even before the um, domain actually becomes valid. For a bad guy, you have to ensure that you have control of the domain at the peak of the time. So it's perfectly explainable that many of those registrations happen even during the validity window of a domain. Um, there's an interesting, what I thought first is an outlier for Barmital. Um, when I look, at, look closer at that one, um, I saw that at one point in time there were domains registered for the same date, but one, two, and three years in advance. So it looks like some, uh, basically the botnet operator wanted to do insurance there. So even if his botnet's, botnet gets taken down, he will have those domains far into the future. Um, it's not a complete thought because you would normally seize those domains as well when doing a takedown. But that, I think, is the, one of the motivations why you would do that. And then I looked for the other families, and I found more, two more families where this is also the case. So both Nymame and Morofet, especially Morofet, with one registration four years in advance. So Morofet also later became, since same code base, um, same DGA, even uh, game over peer-to-peer. -peer. Then we have this one. Um, that's probably also something that you will see later on when you might want to look at the slides again because too much data and so on. Um, Game of Peer, from a DGA point of view, was completely taken down. So there are no registrations valid after the takedown date, which was uh, end of May 2013, 14, 14, yeah. And the last interesting point that I have to point out is this one. I'm not sure how that happened. So either it's my reversing fail or the reversing fail of someone else. Um, for 3B, in 2015, someone registered domains 30 days after they stopped being valid. So it looks to me that someone has an off by one in the, the month there, or it didn't understand the algorithm correctly. At least I debugged the driver, and I'm pretty sure that my data is correct. So whoever was syncoding them 
didn't get any data, I think, from, from what he tried to do there. OK, conclusion. Um, yeah, this is the TLVM part, so please refrain from uh, publishing that. Um, DG Archive, I'm always happy to give out accounts to that service because it makes it more valuable if more people can, can benefit from it. So you can request free access by sending me an email. Uh, one thing, please do not send emails from free mailers because um, I want to maintain some kind of protection for this service. So I need some basic proof of identity. One of the easiest ways to do that is if you send me an email from your corporate account, because then I know where you come from, or you have someone vet for you. Otherwise, if we see each other today in person, I at least know your face, and that's also some kind of trust building, because that's what many of the things here are about, like jean Bermin also said yesterday. Um, future plans. I, um, I want to document this in more detail, because um, even in 15 minutes, I can only put in so and so much information, and I think a paper is a better way to, to do that in more detail. Um, the heuristical domain classifier that I used to find new seeds and DGAs, um, I'm probably also offering that through DG Archive. So if you put in domains, it will at least tell you if it's not in the database that it fits this and that scheme of those DGAs. So this should maybe also be helpful for things that I don't cover yet. Um, I need to do more automation because it's, it was for a long time my free time project and it's becoming quite relevant or usable. And finally, um, I was approached by someone a short time ago um, who said, hey, um, it would be cool. I'm looking up domains and you don't have them in your database and I think other people might feel the same way. So I looked at the logs and actually there's, you can always see some users query for the same domains in, in the same time of day. So normally that means they see that in other telemetry, want to know if it's a DGA domain or not. And I think it would be a good idea to connect those people and if someone else already knows those domains, it um, could be a good thing to basically work together and try to identify those algorithms or those seeds. And in order to give you a glimpse, um, you can use, that's why it's TLV Amber, um, those credentials to check out the service. Um, like last year, this time password is data candy. Um, but this is limited to lookup, so you can throw in domains in the mask you can see there in order to check out domains, but it doesn't allow you to pre-generate those block lists because um, the license under which I give that data out is basically non-commercial and requires you to not use it commercially, so you are not allowed to put those block lists into feeds, but if you are running a cert, you can have all my data. So I like to provide it for fee. And since this was a lot of work and you cannot stem all of that alone, um, I have to say thank you to Johannes Bader. If you are into DJAs, you probably know that name because he is blogging really a lot about this stuff and I collaborate regularly with him on that occasion. And Michael Klatt from um, Domain Tools, obviously. Chris Baker was the guy who hooked me up with Michael Klatt and got all this Domain Tools thing started. John Berminik, we trade DJAs from time to time. Thomas also contributed DJAs and all of the other people um, basically also contributed in one or the other way, be it in, hey, you missed up that seed, or here's another seed, here's another DTA, you should look at that thing, and so on. So thanks to all of you, and especially Shadow Server, because they support my research vastly. Okay. Two minutes. Um, we can do questions or bonus. Who is for bonus and who is for questions? Bonus? Okay. <laughs> Um, I told you that some of those alphabets look somewhat weird. And I'm still not sure if it's intentional because my colleagues said, no, you cannot say it's bugs. Um, but I'm still pretty sure it's bugs. So we, we had this algorithm and um, they tried to map the alphabet from A to Z. And you do this by adding at most 25 to your A. Um, I don't know if people don't understand how modular works. But for seven different algorithms, you can see that they use modulo 25 because they probably want the range to be up to 25. But that makes you end up with 24. So all of those names you can see there will never contain a Z. So they, all of them generate domains that will not contain a Z. Um, some of them mess up twice. So if you split up your alphabet into vowels and consonants and characters and numbers, you have a chance to do that more than once. So that means you end up with 34 or even MuSci, which the author, I think, forgot the letter J. So you then have basically three characters that will never show up. Um, or you can even be more special. 
the way Rumdo is written basically halves the whole alphabet. So they only take every second character. Also not sure if intentionally or not. Uh, Thribby is completely messed up. Topic uses different alphabets for different letters and doesn't reach all. It probably wants your zone as well. Yeah, so that's the one that I cannot cover. Uh, yeah, that was the bonus part. So here we go. Okay, thank you for your attention.